Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming back from yesterday, and also thanks for coming for the ones who are coming today. I will just uh, start by introducing the panel, and then I will introduce the panelists, and so I will sit down for that. Hope that's okay. Um, I would like to leave behind me the conviction that if we maintain a certain amount of caution and organization, we deserve victory. But she cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. In this case, it comes from non-conformity, the courage to turn your back on the old formulas, the courage to invent the future. It took the madman of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today. I want to be one of those madmen. We must dare to invent the future. So this is a small excerpt from um, a Thomas Sankara um, interview that he gave in 1895. Um, uh, 1985, <laughs> and um, yeah, it comes from this book called In Thomas Sankara Speaks, uh, the Burkina Faso Revolution, 85 and 87, and this is also in the um, handout, and I just wanted to mention this because it's very much related to the title of this panel, which is called To Avert Current Political Melancholia, and it was really like during reading this book that I was also thinking about this kind of potency that this, this um, feeling of energy through words, through speeches and through poetry that is like so important and that is somehow we kind of um, still need it. So the reason for this title was to look into, um, into consideration moments in history, um, not only past ones, but also um, also present and also maybe ones that we could imagine that, the, that where there was still a desire and an energy to fight and for, for that we need to be re-enchanted uh, politically and that is a challenge in a time where structural power and structural injustice have created a state of exhaustion that is not only bodily but also psychological and the idea to believe that we can get out of exhaustion uh, since it is a structural exhaustion is of course very um, difficult one but it is still crucial to think about a methodology of re-enchantment or a methodology of hope so like the not yet so to say and what is enchantment? It is to fall under a rapturous spell of magical influences. The word enchantment comes uh, from the word to chant, to chanter, to sing. So for sure, chanting the world into existence may be meditative. Sometimes the movement must stop and sit on its hands. But if we understand song to include poetry, then the call for enchanting the world, for singing creation into being, is both rhapsodic and prophetic. And this um, is, uh, in a way, um, also related to what the panelists will be talking about, this idea of re-enchantment, but also it's my relation to these panelists that also have had an impact of re-enchantment politically, uh, like in my work and um, uh, personal life. And also to, um, as well, to have a, a reference to what was said yesterday um, the idea of sacrifice, which is also very much related uh, in the, to, to um, the idea of partisanship or, or to the practice of partisanship, um, but also to resonate with what Dilar Derrick was talking about, which for me was really important and also really inspiring, that um, sacrifice is a method that reminds us that everything that is alive exists because a part of it has killed itself. This dead part uh, is the protective shell which allow a concatenation to happen inside of it. So the one, the whole, is a construction, yet it is the place where struggles and revolts can entangle. The idea of the united front. Um, though probably a fragmented one, because it's the, maybe the only possible one. And in order to imagine the shell that um, could hold uh, those struggles ghosted and inhabited by each other. I would like to mention love and desire as a cultural force. And this entanglement, this linkage, it is what we try to vo voice as cultural workers. A constant back and forth between what we see, what whom uh, we fight for, what we are conditioned by, while constantly negotiating how far we are willing to go and what and who are we willing to sacrifice. 
The notion of the sacrifice is an important one in relation to partisanship as a material practice, but also as a way of thinking, like a mentality, also a bit like what Vijay was saying. So like maybe having a mentality of a partisan. And now I would like to introduce the speakers uh, whom I'm, uh, to whom I'm really thankful, deeply thankful for taking part of this project and also for the beautiful and intense, intense exchange and for the support. Uh, I will do it in the order of uh, the panel. So I will start with uh, Kirill Medvedev, who's here with me next to me. Kirill Medvedev. Uh, so Kirill is a poet, musician, and left-wing activist based in Moscow. He plays in Akadi Kotz Band. Uh, his books uh, have been published in the US, Estonia, England, and the Netherlands. Um, his small press, the Free Marxist Publishing House, has released translations of Pier Paolo Pazzolini, Mike Davis, and Terry Eglinton, as well as numerous books uh, at the intersection of literature, art, and politics, including a collection of his own essays. Uh, Kirill is also a member of the Russian uh, socialist movement. Kwasi One Aie is a curator and critic based in Kumas, Irana. Uh, his work is compelled by the critical, uh, radical hope uh, proposed by the artist pedagogue Karakishi Sedou uh, to the transform, uh, so to quote uh, Sedou, to transform art from the status of commodity to gift. One Aie is the co-curator of Akutia Blindfolding the Sun and the Poetics of Peace, a retrospective of um, Agyeman Osei Dota organized by Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, Tamale and Red Clay in Rana, as well as co-curator of 12th edition of Bamako Encounters, African Biennale of Photography 2019-2020. Jehan El Tahri, who is also here tonight with us, uh, is a, uh, today, this morning. <laughs> to, uh, she's a multi-award winning film director, writer, visual artist and producer. She's currently um, uh, serving as the general director of the Berlin-based documentary support institution, Dogsbox. Jehan has been a member of the Academy Oscar since 2017 and is currently on the selection committee of the Locarno International Film Festival. She has directed more than 15 films and her visual art exhibitions have traveled to renowned museums and several biennales around the world. Her writings include Les Sept Vies de Yasser Arafat and the 50 Years War, Israel and the Arabs. Um, and this goes on. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here. I give the floor to Kirill. Okay. Uh, so, am I heard? <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for uh, organizers uh, to uh, to uh, invite me uh, to uh, to invite me here because uh, partisan culture uh, and anti-fascism uh, for me it's not something uh, formal and not uh, something just uh, tra traditional, but uh, uh, it's uh, something very urgent. It's something uh, I'm trying to think about. Um, um, uh, just uh, always and uh, so um, I wanted to say that uh, there are uh, two uh, global issues and two problems c connected with partisan heritage in Russia and the way uh, me and uh, my uh, my comrades people from my milieu just deal with them and first problem is that the partisan heritage and anti-fascist heritage in general uh, in Russia uh, is kind of occupied by, by the regime, by establishment, uh, which claims to be anti-fascist and uh, uses anti-fascism as official state narrative uh, for self-defense uh, or even sometimes uh, for expansion. And uh, for example, they like to use it uh, when, when they need to denounce uh, some ultra-right revisionism uh, in former USSR countries like uh, Ukraine or Latvia. Uh, but of course they uh, do it not for the sake of real anti-fascism, uh, real sincere, anti-fascism, but just for the sake of some ge geopolitical interests of their own. 
and unfortunately, it's quite easy to, uh, to instrumentalize anti-fascism, partly because uh, during uh, and after the World War II, all this partisan and anti-fascist discourse was, stri was stri uh, strictly controlled uh, by uh, state, by official ideology, and uh, as more Soviet regime pre presented itself as a system which dates back to revolution, to this event of self-organization of working class, the more it tried to control everything connected with self-organization and partisan discourse, of course, because partisan discourse is something very deeply connected with self-organization. It's a principle easier. And that's why it's quite difficult, but still, uh, still possible to reclaim this discourse now. And uh, by the way, I read with great interest works by uh, uh, Gal Kier, uh, Kiern about Yugoslav uh, Yugoslavian partisan uh, a movement and partisan culture. And uh, it was very interesting because there is, I see, as I see it, a great difference uh, with Soviet context. Just because, uh, again, s Soviet partisan heritage was much more controlled by official ideology, and that's why it's much, uh, 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 and it's much more di difficult to find now uh, in this partisan archive some immediate, uh, I mean, not mediated by ideological structures of state, forms of, uh, of aesthetic self-representation. Uh, I need to mention that what we really have, and it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon, is a tradition of underground poetry uh, produced by former uh, soldiers of Red Army, of Soviet Army, who chose to be uh, unpublishable, to escape a censorship after war, and then late, uh, late uh, Soviet times, in order to express some hidden and problematic aspects of war uh, connected with either with the emotions which considered shameful in official context, emotions such as fear, fear of a soldier, or connected with the violations of human rights uh, by Soviet army, uh, or women's rights, or rapes, uh, and all that. Uh, but why the regime uh, can instrumentalize anti-fascist victory uh, more or less easily? It's just because there is something f fundamental in it for the whole nation, for the whole co contemporary Russian nation. They used to, to, to be three basic foundations of Soviet national or supranational identity in Soviet period. It was October Revolution, it was a victory in World War II, and it was Gagarin's flight into space. So now we lost revolution as a basis because it appeared something dangerous for new post Soviet nation building, something that can divide this new bourgeois nation. We almost lost Gagarin as something, as something deeply connected with this especially uh, Soviet idea of peaceful uh, uh, cosmos uh, exploration as a part of Soviet, also very specific Soviet progressivism. So we lost two uh, structural elements of uh, this Soviet myth, of Soviet identity. Uh, but the only element we have now is this 
victory in World War II, primarily because it's something connected with post-Soviet imperial revanchism, expansionism in foreign policy, and this idea, this pathos of strong state. So uh, the victory is something fundamental for the nation, for Russian nation in general now, uh, and this statist aspect of victory is a key thing for the regime uh, which uh, inspires these revanchist ten tendencies in the society and doesn't like any self-proclaimed memories of the war, of the World War II. For example, we had this case with a campaign uh, called Immortal Regiment, the Besmertny Polk, when people started to take photos of their relatives uh, who took part in the war, and it came from below and looked very, very powerful, uh, and it was very quickly embraced by establishment and transformed into quite official and absolutely loyal uh, form. Uh, but just because of World War II and a great pa patriotic war, as we call it uh, still in Russia, it's a, a Soviet term, great patriotic war, Velika uh, Atishtina Vaina, and the victory, uh, just because it is so important, we have another side of it, a kind of progress, a progressive emancipatory potential. And we see many uh, self-organized mo movements which put themselves against uh, the regime, against the rich and powerful. Um, I mean, local movements struggling against uh, things that are very urgent in Russia, uh, like, um, like uh, this garbage, uh, garbage pulp, polygons and or cutting forests and parks for the sake of business. Uh, and this uh, problem is a great source uh, for a local self-organization, um, which is searching for its own symbols, its own narrative, and, uh, it ver and very often it uses uh, this World War II and partisan rhetorics connected with struggle with fascists who come to occupy our lands, who control, in fact, who, who control, in fact, our lands uh, with the, the repressive military force, and we have to fight like partisans now, and we have to fight like our grandfathers and our grandmothers just be, be, because fascists are here again. And... Uh, so, in this case, we have uh, something like very progressive patriotic stance, reclaiming partisan identity as a part of, m maybe, I hope so, a part of a project of a new nation, which in this act of partisan self-organization can liberate, can liberate itself, like Soviet nation and like other European nations liberated themselves on World War II. Uh, so in this zone, in this context of local resistance in Russia now, uh, we can mark that anti-fascist slogans and Soviet songs and uh, many other elements of this culture are here again and we witness it, uh, our band, uh, we witness it when we just uh, visit the camps uh, of local ecologists uh, or the de defenders of all city uh, landscapes uh, or uh, trade union activists and all that. We just witness this rehabilitation and this renovation of uh, anti-fascists and so partisan, partisan uh, discourse. But there is one more aspect connected uh, 
with internationalism. We know that victory in World War II was uh, internationalist uh, just b because all the peoples living in USSR took part in this war and some of them, like B B Belarus people, took a great part in partisan movement uh, and some Soviet nations just lost more people in persons than Russians. Uh, but we also know that that there was um, a, a kind of Stalinist notion uh, of uh, of nation as a kind of uh, of Russian nation as a kind of big brother or even a father for, for all other s Soviet peoples. Uh, um, uh, it was la launched before the war. Uh, and it was connected with reclaiming of some empire even attributes uh, during war and uh, and some pre-revolutionary uh, pre figures like some Tsars, like Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible and all that. <coughs> so, and it was much like a new vision of history, a statist one, a uh, statist vision to top down and not history from below, the history of exploited fighting against state power, the narrative uh, we had after October Revolution. And this uh, Stalinist vision projects itself now into our times. And many people uh, in Russia, with the help of state propaganda, feel uh, sure that uh, for many people now in Russia, this victory became just more Russian than Soviet, and more Soviet uh, than international. Uh, uh, and um, oh, now what are our ch challenges here? We have, uh, first, we have to promote this multinational vi vision of Soviet victory and internationalist, and internationalist vision uh, of anti-fascist victory in general. Uh, uh, and it's very important for, for us this, uh, that uh, this vision, uh, that this idea of common history of different Soviet uh, nations and republics, uh, it's a, an, a reason and argument now uh, when we deal with anti-migration uh, challenges in Russia now, which are very strong. Uh, when uh, we say that migrant workers, who are m mostly people from Central Asia republics, which were part of Soviet Union, and uh, uh, these people, these young migrant workers, they are just, uh, just grandsons and granddaughters of uh, the people uh, who fought in that war. And uh, the, we have to remind this fact to those who are sure now that uh, these people, uh, these nations, uh, these republics, their cultures, their religion, it's a part of some other si civilization with, which has no, uh, nothing in common with us. But this anti-colonial uh, case is not only connected with Central Asia, but also uh, with other republics such a, uh, as Ukraine. Uh, just because the Russian regime presents itself as a heritage of the victory and uh, this position enforces ultra-right in former Soviet republics, like in Ukraine, uh, which are also trying from their side to put this equal mark be between Soviet and Russian, between Russian and anti-fascist, uh, as something dangerous for building the new national uh, states. And for us, it seems uh, productive the idea of reclaiming Soviet anti-fascism in, uh, and forming its particular versions in former, in former republics and uh, insisting that uh, this Soviet anti-fascism is not only property of Russia now, and that all former, repu all former Soviet republics and uh, uh, it's with their local narratives and uh, local memories, uh, which may be quite 
different, loaded with uh, strong national and uh, anti-Stalinist and all that narratives. It's a part of our common uh, common history, common heritage, and uh, um, it can be e a way out even now. It's situation is very difficult. We, uh, we're trying to search a kind of new platform between people in Russia and people in Ukraine uh, who just are ready to apply to our common history, but in very reformed, renewed manner. Uh, so we have our band ha have the song about uh, Lyudmila Pavlichenko, uh, a legendary Soviet woman a sniper uh, during World War II. Uh, uh, the song written by Woody Guthrie, an American singer. Uh, he wrote it um, after she visited America and delivered her legendary speech asking American establishment, where are you in this fight? And uh, we have a Russian version of this song uh, made by an artist, Nikolai Olenikov. I see him <laughs> now <laughs> here. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, where we, in a kind of rather provocative manner, we d depict uh, pa pa Pavlichenko as anti-fascist in, in, in a rather anti-historic way, in a very co contemporary you know, manner, like we depict her as an anti-fascist who fights also, not only just with German uh, uh, invaders, uh, but also with homophobia and, uh, with, uh, and with Stalinism. So, of course, she was a Stalinist. She was a part of, you know, of Stalinist uh, state, and there is a, a famous photo of her under the photo of uh, Stalin. Uh, but that's the thing that uh, that the weapon the, uh, that art can provide us uh, with. And I just w I wanted to say about a film, a movie uh, called Fight for, for Sevastopol, made uh, recently by, by Russian and Ukrainian and Ukrainian filmmakers together. And there is a progressive uh, message uh, there. Uh, connected uh, with uh, the thing that, that Ukrainian origin of Pavlichenko and with dif di different di details is, is pretty well highlighted there in the frame again of this common anti-fascist frame of course and uh, I think it's a good example of just of remapping this traditional Soviet and post-Soviet anti-fascist a narrative, and we have also a very interesting case in in B B Belarus now, where there was extremely powerful partisan movement, and it it became a cornerstone for Soviet Belarus identity. And now we also see a kind of competition over this narrative between Lukashenko regime and his ideologists, uh, who base uh, in many ways on Soviet Be Belarus identity. And opposition, which is not so mostly, is not so complementary to uh, Soviet heritage uh, as Russian opposition, because, uh, because Russian opposition now is, is mostly co communist, uh, especially in regions. But Be with Be Belarus opposition, it's another case. They are, uh, they are traditionally more pro-Western and more anti-Soviet, uh, and being almost totally suppressed into underground now. Uh, they are also trying uh, to reactualize this partisan tradition and to put it against the regime. And we see uh, for the last few months uh, the, the telegram uh, channels uh, of opposition uh, use the word partisans when writing about activists of opposition, which really which now really beca becoming more and more partisan-like, using violent methods uh, against state repression. So the case of Belarus is also very interesting and very uh, specific. I'm moving to the end. Uh, so what we have now in general in Russian ideological uh, uh, is 
is Russian ideological establishment trying to instrumentalize anti-fascism as uh, partly anti-European political platform from the one side, and the idea of anti-fascism as something which bounds Russians and Europeans together from the other side. I will just cite my, uh, if you please, just cite my, uh, my article uh, in uh, The Guardian. Um, 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 Just a moment. Um, <clears throat> in modern day in Russia, meanwhile, this, uh, the legacy of the Second World War has been co-opted uh, by the country's leadership in pursuit of its own interests. Uh, of its own interests, take the war in Eastern uh, Ukraine, which started in uh, um, uh, 2014. This was sold to the Russian people on the basis of uh, Gina pre presence of far-right elements among the anti-Russian Maidan supporters. In other words, the Kremlin ju justified its petty expansionism into a neighborhood country under the guise of carrying out a modern-day anti-fascist uh, mission. So uh, there is a more a hopeful image of the past and present one that binds Russians and Europeans together, that progressives across Europe can draw on. Um, When I hear of so-called European values, I don't think of false historical equivalences of P P Putinist propaganda about European moral decline and all that. I see the European of mass trade unions and Euro Europe partisans and the uh, Europe of workers' rights and the Europe of February strike in the German-occupied uh, Netherlands in, in defense of per persecuted uh, Dutch uh, Jews uh, um, during the World War II and all that. So um, uh, when the Russian state today appeals to our historic, uh, heroic past, this progressive history is certainly not what it has in mind. Uh, and, uh, but it is what I will keep as the forefront of my mind during the Victory Day uh, celebrations uh, on official media, a ceremony that will reek of false patriotism. I mean, the show of Putinist nationalism. I will recall the sincere songs of Italian, Yugoslav, and Belarusian guerrilla fighters, anti fascist workers, and the Jewish resistance. And a love for our respective home countries and an upgraded anti fascist consensus is the only progressive foundation in which our co co continent uh, can rest. So, um, uh, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so that the idea of our uh, pro project, which we are going to present tonight, it is called uh, uh, Trans European Partisan Jam. It's a, a musical album a collection made by our band. Uh, it's a collection of resistance songs uh, from Italy, Spain, Yugoslavia, France, Roma and Jewish peoples, Greece and USSR. And our aspiration was just not to explain, uh, not to explore this political, uh, uh, was to explore this political common ground with aesthetical method and to find this, uh, um, that this very different and mostly associated with uh, national cultures uh, songs uh, uh, are, ve are very much international and internationalist uh, in the background and in the level of aesthetics. And just because everybody knows that Bella Ciao is, as an, is an Italian song, uh, but not everybody knows uh, that its melody was written by a Jew from uh, uh, New York. <laughs> and there is a legendary song of Jewish partisans, uh, which we also are going to sing today in Russian. Uh, the text was written in Yiddish uh, by Hirsch Glick, uh, a Jewish poet uh, from Vilnius. Uh, who died uh, during uh, the resistance, but it was put into music by Soviet co composers, b brothers Pokras and 
we know that the idea of Holocaust as strictly, particularly Jewish catastrophe is something that was not very popular among Soviet establishments. So we have here a kind of productive conflict, uh, productive co conflict made by this uh, spontaneous col collaboration of, of uh, long ago. So we just wanted to show by means of art this di dialectics of progressive patriotism dating back to European and Soviet resistance and internationalism, um, international co cosmopolitan history, uh, which is at the background and at the core of anti-fascism, of new anti-fascism traditions that we need so desperately. So it's uh, an invitation. Welcome to our concert tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kirill. I just uh, want, uh, I forgot to mention that um, the questions will, you can uh, keep them for the end of the panel. So uh, now it's going to be the turn of Kwasi One Aye. Can you hear me, Kwasi? Yes, I can hear you. Hey, Kwasi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, the floor is yours. How's everyone? Good. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Aziza. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this. And thanks to the team. I'm just sharing my screen now, so my presentation will be up. Okay. Um, yes, thanks again to everybody for making this um, happen. I'm very excited to be here. I want to contribute uh, by way of talking about uh, Black Star Lines, which is a contemporary art institution um, based in Kumasi in Ghana, but with networks all across um, Africa and other parts of the world. But approaching the topic from um, the perspective of contingency and political indifference. So, uh, and then I will zoom into the way the emancipatory um, pedagogy that has been actualized or invented to suit our, our needs, uh, how, how it works. Um, just a few facts about the institution. Um, it's a transgenerational and transcultural community operating on the on the generative model um, it is based on it was formalized in 2015 um, based in the department of painting and sculpture at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology um, in Kumasi in Ghana and uh, Black Star Alliance is hinged on the universalist principle of preemptive equality uh, it has a lineage of radical and community projects dating back to the 1990s, and it is uh, the institution responsible for demystifying art from its classical and pre-1960s European modernist predeterminations in Ghana's foremost art college in Kumasi. Um, the legacy of the, uh, the colonial list um, intervention. So it's also actively building hard and soft infrastructure, um, including co-developing cultural platforms, curriculums, residencies, social networks, students, and public spaces, and art spaces um, uh, in art and in Ghana and beyond. Um, it is also invested in uh, generating tactical responses to the many crises that plague um, us culturally, uh, economically, um, and and in other ways, and we try to improvise even through this condition. Um, Black Star Alliance projects explore the interfaces between uh, the non-human and human, human and post-human, and 
you know, this orientation emerges out of um, our attitude to site or to situate art in, um, in, the, in the space of the void. So for us, we say that if art is anything, it, it, can, um, it, it must be invented. And I think that uh, aligns earlier with what you said, uh, Aziza, about inventing futures. That is precisely our task here in Kumasi. So um, we, we don't preemptively populate art with any specific uh, content, be it via style, medium, uh, subject matter. We say that art could emerge from anywhere, uh, the humanities, um, natural sciences and so on and so forth. So uh, this means that we are not privileging any particular um, approach or content as, uh, as the one that determines what art is or not. So the void, we need the void uh, as a space for the universal, as the space for um, to assert equality. And we say that we privilege no center in terms of our conception and our um, actualization of art. So once we cite, uh, once we conceptually cite this, uh, the determination of art in, in this void, what happens is that the correlates that emerge uh, also matter to us. So that, that's where uh, multiplicity, equality, universality, indifference, contingency, secularity, and radical eminence also become important. So the title I picked for this, um, this uh, presentation is based on this background and the concerns that we share back home. Uh, so for us, there are three main things that we uh, align ourselves to. The, task of intellectual emancipation, consequent of um, uh, generations or let's say millennia of um, imperial as well as uh, colonial um, regimes which we have had to deal with. So uh, it is necessary to exercise one's emancipation intellectually as well as um, e economically. And so, and then that leads us, or that conditions us to be politically sensitive to the to 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 the practice that we have assigned ourselves to, be it artistic, uh, non-artistic. The point is to have a consciousness that is aware, that is dispositionally global, and that is um, uh, yeah that pr privileges um, the uh, egalitarian engagements. So Fred Moulton and Stefano Hani have a way of describing the undercommons of the university, which resonates with what we do back home as well, which I thought would be um, interesting to share. They, they describe it as where the commons gives refuge and where the refuge gives commons. You know, this, this uh, captures the, the spirit of what we are trying to, to to work on here. Um, Jean-Joseph Jacotot, the 19th, the 19th century French uh, pedagogue also has a way of articulating um, intellectual emancipation that is, a, that is very compelling. He says that equality is neither given nor claimed. It is practiced, it is verified. So, um, this is really our, our uh, we agree with this. And we say that um, equality is not the destination. We begin from there. And it is where we begin uh, our thinking, our um, interventions into the, the various modes and forms that we ourselves uh, practice, and as well as contemporary art. So contemporary art, as we see it, is also not a destination. It is um, where we begin, where we can begin to uh, account for the multiplicity as such. 
um, that has entered art since the late 1980s and um, how can one can how one could um, you know venture into self-determination uh, on their own terms essentially the attitude or the approach we take is also affirmative uh, which I would just take a, a simple description by Rossi Bradotti who talks about it as collective assemblage to redefine what we are capable of becoming. This notion of becoming is, the, um, is very crucial because that is where uh, contingency and historicalness are also captured. And Black Star Alliance is heavily influenced by um, ideas, post-war, uh, mid-century, emancipatory ideas uh, from Africa, advanced by the Pan-Africanist Kwame Nkrumah, who was uh, Ghana's first president. And uh, Nkrumah's ideas for a post-colonial African subjectivity uh, was not solely cultural or solely based on symbolic um, parameters. What he was offering was a very sophisticated materialist, uh, you know, philosophy or ideology that would take into account the past, the present and the future of the Africa. So Nkrumah talks about um, revolutionary ideo ideologies as those that seek to introduce a new social, a new social system. At the same time, it is not merely negative. So um, it is not just a refutation of a dying social order, but it is a positive creative theory, the guiding light of the emerging social order. Um, so he talks about becoming as a tension and being uh, as the child of that tension of opposed forces and tendencies that uh, that are already present, but through which one must forge um, a modern present and future. So we are inspired by this and we, um, in terms of what we call um, being dispositionally indifferent, what we mean it in terms of uh, its politics, and it being a tactical uh, posture. Um, Karikacha Seidu, the artist pedagogue who uh, in my spiritual art teaching project inspired the, the, um, the creation of Black Star Alliance as a, as a community, has this to say. He says that um, in an emergency, if I have to use a tool fashioned by my oppressor, I will not hesitate to use it. Um, elsewhere, he has said that, uh, you know, what if the tool was stolen from you in the first place? So um, this indifferent posture we have is, is a tactical one. It is one that conditions itself to understand um, the, the present conditions, the historical conditions, and what one must do that ethical step, what one must do to emerge out of it. Um, it may require uh, employing contradictory logics. Uh, one must not shy to do that. There's already precedent. Um, in Chroma, again, uh, during the post-war years of Ghana's Fresh Republic, talks about, uh, and in the thick of the Cold War tensions, talks about, um, you know, Ghana facing or Africa facing neither east nor west, we face forward. Um, and Kuma was, again, um, a tactician here. He was drawing resources from both uh, the western side of the world as well as the eastern side of the world around that time. So to be dispositionally indifferent uh, for us today, is necessary for the task of emancipation if we if we um, 
cite art or the task of emancipation as emerging from the void, the space of the void, as we have, as I have already talked about. I'll outline a few um, things about the methods or the our strategies in in terms of the pedagogy that we um, subscribe to, and it was largely theorized by uh, Karikacha Sedu, whose unpublished PhD thesis gives us the the uh, the details of his Emancipatory Art Teaching Project, which began in 2003. Uh, this is when he joined the faculty in Kumasi in the Department of Painting and Sculpture. So um, yeah, that, that project is the one that we can trace as, the, uh, as outlining the, the strategies and the, um, and the points out of which, you know, the, this, Future that we have inherited um, begins to flourish. So it's based on a generative uh, pedagogy, or what uh, other commentators have called anarchic uh, pedagogy, which is teaching how to teach, massifying the apparatus of instruction, of teaching. This is where the peer to peer. Um, uh, strategy of teaching and learning comes into play. Um, you have a formal institution where the traditional distinctions of an art college, you have the formal institution of an art college where the traditional distinctions between um, you know, a teacher and a student is always there. But working through that, how do you subvert it? Um, contra or going against the colonial um, education, like the logic of colonial education of uh, tabula rasa, where you know the, the indigenous are just really pretty logical; they are blank. You know, you have to um, the the in our case, um, Britain had to come in. Uh, teach us or stabilize us. Um, we all know it's false, but how do you um, go, go against it when it has been or become so ingrained in a, in a, in a formal institution of education? You know, so what we, what, one of the ways that we um, approach the, the problem to subvert it is, um, yeah, employing this principle of the equality of intelligence, which uh, now becomes, it's not the tabula rasa, but it's what each one can bring to the engagement um, and learning from each other. And also one of the radical things they do uh, teaching method opened up um, in our times was to teach or to, to, to be able to teach what one does not know. Once you grant the equality of intelligence, um, one, it's, it's not that somebody doesn't know something uh, by default. It is that somebody can learn something. And once you learn it from somewhere or from someone, you can teach it. Essentially, anybody who has the interest, the will and the, um, uh, yeah, the desire to embark on that magenic can do that. So um, that's one of the things at play. And he talks about uh, transforming art from the status of commodity to gift. Um, the operation at play there is to is to undermine the the um, the over dependency on the market or on um, capitalist systems that art has become so much ingrained. How can we become a sharing uh, community? So some, some of the curatorial models that have emerged out of these ethics and uh, principles are collective curating, uh, intergenerational conversations, accessibility programming and class sensitive audiencing. Um, we update 
Pierre Huygens um, concern to, you know, where he critiques um, tra tra traditional exhibition practices as only uh, showing something to someone, um, you know, and that he wants to show someone to something. For us, we want to do both. We want to show something to someone and show someone to something at the same time so that the gazes are, um, you know, it's, it's, it becomes reflexive. Right? Um, we consider the exhibition as experimental site, exhibition as archipelago, the exhibition as a site of immanent con contradictions that is always, um, you know, becoming or negotiating its presence in, in, in time and space. Uh, these are, I'll show you a few of the interventions that have emerged by artists and by um, others. This is, these are three institutions which were built, uh, I think from 2019 up until now. They were founded by um, Ibrahim Mahama, the artist who is, um, yeah, who is an active, member of the collective. So he he founded SCCA Tamale, um, which is to the far left, um, Red Clay, an institution in the middle, and then uh, Nkrumah Bolin, uh, where he acquires a, an unfinished grain silo built in the 60s by, the, by Nkrumah's government. So Ibrahim's Practice is largely uh, influenced by failure and the potentialities in failure. So he uh, acquires this, and what he wants to do is to uh, he he cites this in Tamil, which is further north in Ghana. It has prior to this, it had a, a, almost no um, almost no real infrastructure in, in uh, contemporary art. And so this has, in the few years that it has existed, it has literally transformed everything, changed everything. The first few years that um, Ibrahim talks about dedicating the first decade of the exhibitions or the life of the institutions to retrospectives. So, um, and this was inspired by the um, intergenerational co conversations that Black Star Alliance has been uh, working on. So, so far, uh, to the left, there was a, uh, the first retrospective which coincided with the opening of SCCA Tamale um, in pursuit of something beautiful, perhaps. It was for um, Mr. Kofi Dawson, who, who was born in 1940 and part of the first group of students in the KNUST Art School. So Ibrahim reaches out to him, talks to him about having a solo show, a retrospective, and, um, and he makes it happen. Um, and this was crucial to establishing the importance of Dawson's work because then he dies, I think a month or so ago, um, he just passed literally this year. So, um, in, and, and then the second one, which uh, that by the first show was curated by a colleague of mine, and Quay Jackson. The next one in 2020 was a retrospective of um, Ajma Ose, who is also uh, an alumnus of the, of the art school. So he, he was born in 1960 uh, and I co-curated a show with Tracy Thompson and Adra Moa. So we, we are thinking of uh, people like Felicia Aban, uh, who, who is um, in the 80s now, um, about one of the first women photographers from Ghana and so, so many others, not only from Ghana. So that is the, the, the vision. Yeah, Ibrahim as, as an individual brain, which is extending these ideas I've talked about. This shows you um, a spirit, you know, there. this is at our large scale exhibition. The third in the trilogy of exhibitions, which was titled Orderly Disorderly in 2017. You know, you get the vibe of the exhibition spaces where um, 
yeah, you know, once you're targeting uh, different audiences, you are also creating um, work that will, you know, um, kind of complement or, uh, um, yeah, see how all these different engagements and experiences work together in one space. Um, in terms of audience, in, you see the way, if you look at the, um, this is Red Clay, the, the, one of the institutions founded by uh, Mahama, and it is located in a remote part of Tamale. So it's not in an urbanized space. Therefore, you are going to have to invent ways of uh, mediating um, the works in terms of their reception, their meaning, but how to do it, you know, not so heavily that you 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 end up with a paternalistic uh, relationship, but how you allow the um, audiences to come in, uh, co contribute to the to the vibe that is already present uh, is crucial. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the key things that um, Ibrahim and his team are working on. Uh, also at All Lady Disorderly, this is a work uh, by Livingston and Marco that, was, that is commenting on, um, the, yeah, the effects of ecological crisis in, in, the, in, in the town where he's from, where snails, uh, like the snail population have, uh, have been adversely affected, but also how he brings that, uh, how he brings this um, aesthetic interpretation to to that idea and and um, brings this life form into the space that comes to uh, add to what is already more present the organic the synthetic life forms and uh, things like that um, this is work by Akwesia Frane Bidiako in a show I, I I worked on with my collectives in, um, in France um, he employs uh, um, augmented reality and virtual reality apparatuses in his work. Um, you know, just dealing with um, the effects of, of how do you say, uh, e-waste, but also just, um, yeah, our relationship with technology, you know, um, in, in the 21st century. Tracy Thompson's work, is largely post-producing ultra-processed foods that we have uh, that we consume um, in our everyday lives. So um, she su she subjects them to so many different processes, but also her interest in plasticity um, is what ties all this together. Uh, Kelvin Hazel's work uh, that also responds to um, the, the uh, imaging as we, as we have it today on incorporating, you know, dif different techniques um, from sculpture to installation to, uh, to light um, in realizing his ideas. Um, and he also incorporates Braille into his work. So that is a, um, it's a reading system that is tactile that becomes a layer on his own uh, works. Uh, this is, I think, 2015 or 2016. Um, Ibrahim Mahama's intervention in one of the large scale shows that we did in Accra. Um, on the peer to peer learning, uh, one of the things we do, or one of the things that St. Louis work. Uh, by the Emancipatory Teaching Project did was to initiate uh, a series of exhibitions where students, undergraduate, postgraduate, are uh, uh, required to curate their own exhibitions. So um, you are not just acting as, a, as an artist, but you are performing different roles in your own uh, show. And that was to also respond to the lack of uh, curatorial um, yeah, like the, there was a death of curating. And so this was to make 
was to um, you know change that in a way and then introduce that level or that um, layer of practicing also into our our own work and here you have the uh, real literate audiences accessing the the tutorial statements and um, I've made these videos soundless because uh, they are really ambient sounds. I wanted to speak over them to give you the proper context. So we do this at, at all of our exhibitions. We try to um, open up the accessibility programming in a way that will, will complement um, the universality that we seek to achieve, anticipating audiences of various um, abilities. Uh, yeah, the workshops and the learning programs are also um, SCCA Tamale. Uh, yeah, they do this with, with primary schools, with um, other uh, with other um, institutions. They have um, the airplanes you saw, you, you see that to the right, uh, you have a few airplanes that are landed there. Derelict. Uh, what Ibrahim is doing is to um, renovate them, the interior, so that they become laboratories uh, and spaces where people or you know uh, his team and um, they offer uh, lessons, programs, workshops in in various disciplines: technology, um, science, um, you know, art and so on. So um, some of the collectives that have emerged out of the Black Star Alliance uh, group um, or the community, um, I'll just list a few. This is Asaf of Black. It's a Gen Z group of artists who are really um, making very good and interesting work. Um, there are six of them, Samu Bakote, Denise Gao, Mensa, Nuna Adesit Mudo, Larry Bonchaka, Scrapa, and Jeffrey Otu. Uh, Pia is, is an artist residency instituted by Babene, Elik M. actually also known as Craziness Artist. Uh, he, it, it has been running, it's an international uh, residency, so Mabad is based in Kumasi, so the various exchanges are. Uh, um, Realize the exit frame is a collective that I myself belong to. I have four other colleagues, Atwanan, Ajoamwa, uh, Bernard Akwe Jackson, and Kelvin Hazel. We only a year ago started the Crit Lab, which is a professional development program um, geared to uh, kind of create this active network of artists, critics, and curators who are constantly in um, in in, in conversation. So it's it's an annual program. We had a successful one last year. This year we're set to open or begin in November. Um, so at Black Star Lines, which is really the paradigm that kind of uh, opened up all these different approaches to, to challenge the, um, the Boza Canon that had been instituted in, in the consciousness of art in Ghana. We say that we hack, we liberate, we fail, we resurrect. And to put a twist on the Sankofa uh, myth, I don't know if any one of us has, uh, has heard it, but um, caricature Seydou in his, um, in his dialectical vision of what the future can hold uh, for an emancipated subject today, complicates the legend. So he says that um, it has been customary to read the song of Aribus in historicist contextualist terms as a mythical bed which returns to a forgotten past in order to reclaim in a nostalgic way what it might have left behind. In my new reading, however, Sankofa attempts to grasp what it might have forgotten from futures that are to come. And it is, uh, on this basis that I will end the presentation. Thank you.
you, Kwasi. It was great. Uh, thanks also for staying with us later for the Q&A. Uh, so I will just um, call Jihan on stage and then we come back to you, Kwasi, later with the questions with everyone. Thanks. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, so, I get to be physical too. <laughs> um, it's quite interesting that he ends on Sankofa because that uh, all these different presentations kind of tie in together. Sankofa is one of the phases of the program I'll be talking to you about later. So, uh, potent ways of averting political melancholy. When Aziza first talked to me about that, I thought the title was really interesting. and thought quite a bit about it. Um, I would say potent ways of challenging political melancholy because averting them, I think, is... Um, I'm not quite sure how it could happen. Um, so to start, for me, um, flea markets. I'm going to start in the flea market. Flea markets are among the most fascinating spaces that can really trigger the possibility of alternative narratives. There's always this mixture of promise, hope, and a certain melancholy. Um, but one thing is certain that every object there had a past life and has somehow survived hoping for a better future. And um, I remember that the first time I acquired the film reel was in a flea market. In Egypt, we call it Su um, Telet. Um, I was about 15, and I remember the vendor um, was taking out the celluloid and throwing it out of the canister and selling the canister. And I wondered why the canister was more worthy than what it contained. Um, so I started collecting what he was throwing out. Um, and I built myself this giant reel. I, I didn't really know what was in it, but I was collecting these reels and tying them all together. Um, but my efforts were unfortunately interrupted um, when the jewelers found out that there's um, silver residue, and they started buying all the reels um, in bulk. Um, just because to, to get the silver component. So that battle was slightly bigger than me, and in many ways, it still is. So now, 35 years down the line, I'm still obsessed with archive. Um, discarded pictures, various kinds of imagery that stubbornly refuse to disappear and somehow find their way to flea markets or lay silent in family vaults waiting to be liberated. It feels like they're pleading with us to give them back their voice, rescue them from the faulty indexing and reinterpreting their context from a different gaze so they can tell their story that has been silenced, or at least I continue to hope so. Um, so archive for me is not about glorifying the past, but rather about the need to understand the interruption, that broken chain of knowledge and the ability to reinvent ourselves within the contours of our own condition. The alternative knowledge we only get when we stumble upon it by accident. And I'll tell you the story of one of my uh, big discoveries, which kind of connects with here. I, I was making this film called Cuba's African Odyssey. Actually, it wasn't called Cuba's African Odyssey. When I was making the film, it was called Requiem for Revolution. And uh, later, I mean, some other time, I'll tell you how all this became Cuba's African Odyssey, but anyway. Um, 
So uh, one of the things I do when I start my research is that I um, ask to declassify documents. And of course, to get the declassified documents, it takes six, seven months and the rest of it. And so you get on with it until these documents appear. And um, everything I have read, uh, I had read all the research, everything available um, about these African revolutions was framed within the context of proxy wars. And when I got the big envelope with the declassified documents, half of them, of course, blotted out, um, there was this one telegram which was like a four-liner that was a um, uh, uh, how do you say that? Um, yes, uh, yeah, uh, of a conversation between Khrushchev and Fidel Castro. And that was in 1964. And they were slagging each other like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like, now hold on a minute, there's a problem here because I was working on that moment when the Cubans were in the Congo, and obviously they were there on behalf of the Russians because it's proxy wars, right? So how are they slagging each other? <laughs> so I kind of had to ask that question. It was so much easier to just forget that four lines and get on with it. But unfortunately or fortunately, I pursued that. And I, everybody I asked about, you know, why would the Russians support the Cubans going to the Congo if they're on bad terms and it was right there and there? And everyone would say, hmm, I don't know. Until finally, someone, the guy who was responsible, Vladimir Shubin, who was responsible for the Africa Department at the KGB, he says, um, we didn't know. It's like, what do you mean you didn't know? <laughs> he said, we didn't know that the Cubans were in the Congo. So my four years of work were kind of erased in a minute, and I had to start somewhere else. Um, and what was interesting is that I really had one question. It's like, how did you get there? <laughs> and so my only way of finding out was I knew that Che went to the Congo with 123 soldiers, all of them black. And unfortunately, they only had code names, which were Swahili for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So um, had to find an alternative method of finding them. Found them, and suddenly a completely different narrative came out. Um, maybe the best way is to show you a little clip. Yeah, finales del mes de enero. Fui llamado al Estado Mayor del Ejército Central. E inmediatamente me dijo, hace falta que empiece a reclutar a, a un grupo de 30 compañeros de la lucha contra bandido y otro que tú conozcas. Que sean negros, bien negro era la palabra exacta en aquel momento, que estén dispuestos a, a cumplir una misión internacionalista, que puede ser que no regrese ninguno, me dice con claridad. For months, training was concealed in the depths of the Cuban forest. Soldiers were aware that the coming mission would be abroad, but none of them knew where or when it would take place. Drecke was the main contact with the leadership, but even he was in for a surprise. El compañero Manny se fue. Me va a ver y me dice, bueno, hay un comandante que te quiere saludar, que hace tiempo que no te ve, que es muy amigo tuyo. Y me lleva varias fotos de una persona, un hombre blanco, Y le digo, oye, hermano, yo no, no me acuerdo, hermano, no lo conozco. Este comandante yo no lo conozco, pero ¿dónde es yo? Ahí pasan los días. Inventé unas cuantas gente, le dije que quería que conocieran a un amigo interesantísimo. Admito a Raúl y a... Y estoy almorzando. Y veo un señor que está sentado por allá. Y dice, hermano, mira, este está el comandante Ramón. ¿Tú no lo conoces? Yo no lo conozco. Hasta 
Es indiscutiblemente fueron muy capaces nuestra gente. ¿ves? Y él eh, va entonces a un lugar de Pinante Río. Tenía una casa allí. Y yo no sé, en ese tema, él escogió a la gente que él quería. Y ahí sí enviamos un buen refuerzo con el chico. Que fueron alrededor de 150 hombres. Bien ganados. Y con una experiencia. Eso era vital para la revolución. Que nadie conociera que era el Che. El Che, igual que Fidel y Raúl, son de los dirigentes más buscado por los terroristas internacionales, por el paralismo yanqui, para asesinarlo. Traíamos para acá para la mano. Eh, se empezó a comprar eh, ropa, llevar ropa, ropa interior, esto, la maleta. Los trajes se compraban por serie, ¿no? Sí, un montón de trajes, todos eran igual. Además, casi era la misma talla, casi todo. <ríe> Y de la calidad, más o menos, igual todo. Eh, la maleta, una maleta grandísima y todo eso, pero la maleta iba vacía, porque ahora las dos camisas, dos calzoncillos, porque el traje todo estaba puesto. Entonces, si todos éramos igual, negro, todos vestidos igual, llamaba la atención, ¿eh? Che Guevara's disguise was more discreet, and his group of 14 men landed in Tanzania without any prior warning. Che's presence had to remain secret, so his identity was not even divulged to the Lumumbists he had come to help. Kabila était au Caire, on m'appelle, j'étais seul. On m'appelle, voilà, le groupe de d'instructeurs cubains est arrivé. À la tête se trouve le commandant Victor Drake, qui est un spécialiste du maquis. J'étais très impressionné. Y yo estoy de Che Guevara, déguisé, yo lo reconozco. Bueno, Che se auxilia en un diccionario francés, eso ágil, para ir ubicando el nombre de cada uno de los compañeros. En el caso mío me pone el, el uno que es Moya, y ellos para el primero del uno, y es el más grande, que más manda el uno, tenía que ponerme a mí en Moya. Se pone el entre Tato, como médico y como traductor, es decir, para que no hubiese duda de por qué Che, siempre que yo estaba, tenía que estar él. Alors ils me disent qu'est-ce qu'on fait Kabila n'est pas là, nous ne pouvons pas traîner ici parce que le service d'espionnage britannique travaille ici, américain travaille ici, français travaille ici. Il faut organiser très 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 vite la descente vers le front. J'ai fait une communication à Kabila par téléphone, je l'ai appelé au okay. Caire. Il a dit ben eh, il faut m'attendre, je viens tout de suite. Moi je dis je peux pas attendre, je peux pas l'attendre, je vais les amener. <laughs> okay, um, I, I kind of chose to show that bit on for, for two reasons. First of all, is how do you gather this? How do you tell a story? When I first arrived in Cuba, nobody had pictures. It's like it was secret, so no, we have no pictures. A year and a half into it, each one started to say, well, I have this picture. The eight pictures of the Che, each one was taken from a different source. So gathering, putting together, reconstructing uh, a narrative is a lot of footwork. And basically, the whole thing that came out of it, the shift from what I thought I was doing, which was about proxy wars, to the understanding that what was actually going on was a story about internationalism. That is a story that is not taught to us. It's in none of our books. And even if it failed or if it didn't fail, it's, it's a narrative that very quickly, and especially in the countries of the South, that is not um, uh, amongst the isms that we are taught. Um, The other thing is about this discrepancy between official history and memory. And, uh, and that's the thing about archive, is that, I mean, over the past 35 years, I've gone through many articulations of how does one deal with archive. So a first stage being the archaeology, finding a piece of footage is like the best thing ever. 
and then after a while you say, well, hold on a minute, we've got to contextualize this. And then after a while you say, hmm, what does it represent? So the, the archive is extremely uh, complicated in how you engage with it. And the official history is what archive mainly hands down to us. Because if you think of it, in the 30s and 40s, uh, not the, yeah, even later, all the way up to the 70s, um, to get a camera, you have to get the reel. It's a decision of what is shot and what isn't. And that decision is usually made by the powers that be. Whereas memory is captured more in photographs, is captured in, in family, um, and so how do we fill in these silent spaces? Um, and especially that in the South, uh, colonial rule was very, a, a very successful tool of uh, erasure and assimilation. Um, and I think the worst part of it isn't just um, the displacement, it's the internal displacement and what it is we acquired as narratives that we take for givens. Um, and this whole, um, at the moment of independence, there was this tendency of um, catching up, modernity, throw out the old, come in with the new. Um, uh, just like very much so we see it um, in, in the formats of film. Um, there's a constant change of formats. Um, it's practically impossible today to restore certain formats because, you know, 70 millimeters, you can restore other, you know, that it's, it's, it's a complicated space, both narratively and technically. But there's hope. Hope to adjust this narrative. Um, For those of us who have spent decades trying to work and grapple with the concept of decolonization, um, suddenly this word is feeling extremely uncomfortable. Huh? Um, it feels like the concept of decolonization has won far too many friends um, that are starting to um, empty the word of its content. What do we actually mean by decolonization? Um, you know, uh, the way the word decolonization is circulating, there are even new um, verbs, decoloniality and de, this and that. Um, it, it's, it's sometimes uh, a counterproductive idea to take on a word, latch onto it, um, and by talking about it and making it so visible, it seems as though we've dealt with it when we really haven't even started grappling with what decolonization actually means. Today, we're very far away from decolonization although I myself have been part of many, many talks about decolonization. Um, the concept is being hijacked and emptied of its content. The noise, the cacophony around it overshadows the, the work that still desperately needs to be done. Fortunately or unfortunately, archive footage seems to be undergoing the same fate. In the mid-80s, I was called totally crazy to want to do an archive-based film. And like people would sit me down and say, but you can go shoot. Why do you want to use this uh, second-hand footage? At the time, this whole concept of uh, releasing footage, getting release forms, paying for it was like, you know, you want to do this? Go ahead. <laughs> um, today, it's almost an object of an extractive capitalist industry. How and why did archive footage suddenly become so trendy and sexy? A valuable treasure that many are hunting down. 
the added value bestowed on it by the art world today is a revolution promising an alternative future. So the ball in many ways is in our court now. We could do the legwork to unsilence that footage from our own vantage point, occupy the silent spaces where archive is not just about who holds it, it who not only about those who can decode it, not only about those who have the money to digitize it, although I'm not going to say that because there's someone here who might digitize some of the footage. Excuse me, huh? <laughs> um, we did this um, uh, and trying to grapple with all these notions when uh, I first joined Docsbox with Mohanad Yaqubi here, we worked on archive in several modules and we came up with Liberate the Image Manifesto. It's a manifesto not just about uh, how we use it, it's also about the concept of restitution and what do we actually mean by restitution. Mm. But in any case, it's a complicated legacy that needs radical action to overturn existing ways of doing things and most importantly, a radical change in how we think about things. Um, Six years ago, the head of the CCM in Morocco um, decided, it was his pet project, decided to rest, you know, engage with the Moroccan archive. It took him years to convince his board that it was worth anything. And um, the state in which the Moroccan archive is now is very different from elsewhere on the continent. Can, can you show us some of the number two? So this is the undigitized stock. Go. Um, this also undigitized. This is the digitized and classified or pretty. Yes, and this one here is a stock of Senegalese footage that somehow, not somehow actually, um, the whole concept of collaborations of the 60s and the 70s, um, the Senegalese and the Malian stocks of footage, not all of them, but a lot of them landed in the Moroccan archive. So, the, is this the last one? Um, um, so, uh, uh, the, around the Moroccan and the Senegalese uh, archive, um, I'm going to get to it in a moment, we've started um, a project, maybe it's a bit crazy, but it's a project, uh, called Bridging the Silenced and Liminal Spaces of African Imagery. We take two countries as hubs, which is Morocco and Senegal, um, basically because um, readjusting narratives are not just about the content, they're also about the space. Why do we continue to work within colonial borders if we're actually talking about decolonization? So what we're trying to do is to work with the concept of spaces of cultural harmony and the connections between the north and the south of the continent have always existed. And, and to start off with Morocco, Senegal is, is a very uh, potent one because there's uninterrupted connections from the 1591 with the Saadi dynasty that was both were part of the same space until today where Sufism and the Tijani uh, Sufi order means that there's this up and down movement consistently, although one is considered sub-Saharan Africa and the other is considered North Africa and they should hate each other. Oh, um, uh, the, the archive in Senegal, which was the next stop, was a different ball game. 
So maybe, let's see, I'm showing you. This is what remains um, in good condition of 5,000 reels of footage from the um, beginning of independence. Yes. This is the fancy um, sto storage and, storage and um, uh, uh, restoration of the film department, the center of cinematography. Um, and this is the photo storage. Uh, okay. That's how they're stored. That's the, the negatives. And that's how it's indexed. Okay. And that's the rest. What it says on that, I thought it was very ironic and almost sitting there waiting for me because I don't think anyone had entered that space for a while. It took me almost a year to get them to get me in there. And this was lying there in Arabic, and the title is The New Era. I thought it was very ironic. Um, I don't want to make fun of this because there's nothing to make fun of. It's very easy to criticize and ask whose fault is this. It's everybody's fault. Huh? This is the fallout of the Laval Decree. We forget things like this. The Laval Decree is the decree in 1934 um, where it was forbidden for indigenous peoples to use their image take their image, share their image. So all our heritage of moving image from 1934 and until 1962 is actually taken, used, transferred by colonial powers. So is it in this condition because people don't recognize themselves in the images? Taken of, uh, taken of them? Is it a posture that was imposed on them when they were being filmed? Or is it simply that we have no idea what lies in these canisters and we have no means to find out and we're certainly today not encouraged to examine them? Well, we've decided to embark on that journey. Uh, I have been called crazy before multiple times, so why not one more time? At my age, I don't really have much to lose. Um, so the program Bridging the Silenced and Liminal Spaces of African Imagery ultimately wants to re-examine and adjust the narrative and reconnect the pre-colonial and the colonial. We can't get rid of our colonial heritage, it's part of us. So how do we even reconnect with that? But within a space of cultural harmony, it has two aims, breaking the formats and this distinction of genres imposed on us by institutions, because that distinction itself and these formats themselves do change our own narratives. Uh, and the second one is creating real spaces of collaboration. Um, so in the program, in each one of the hubs, we have an art space, a post-production space, and a community space as partners, because this tradition of people getting financed from the North, coming in with a fantastic program that lasts a year or two, and then off we go, um, cannot be sustainable. So how do we build these um, collectives that are part of this narrative? Um, I think everything says that we're set up to fail um, because something like, how do we digitize this? Do we sell it once more to a colonial power that will give us the money 
but will then own the rights, just at the time we're talking at, uh, about restitution. Um, do we give it to the highest bidder who can help, or do we let those just die away and reinvent them? Or do we try and investigate just once and for all how do we navigate who we are and how do we engage with the remnants of the past? Anyway, I personally will try my best to do something about this. Um, I usually don't quote or do bibliographies or footnotes uh, for many reasons, but anyway, I will end with a quote by Sadia Hartman from Venus in Two Acts, which I think is one of the most amazing pieces of work on. Uh, it says, a history of the present strives to illuminate the intimacy of our experience with the lives of the dead, to write our own now as it is interrupted by this past, by playing with and re-engaging the basic elements of the story, by representing the sequence of events in diverging stories and form contested points of view, to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received and authorized account, and to imagine what might have happened or what might have been said or what might have been done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jehan. Uh, yeah, we we'll continue with the Q and A, but from the whole um, panel, Kirill, maybe you wanna join us again? Yes. Uh, I'll. Yes. And Kwasi is joining us again. It would be great to see him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Kwasi. Hey, Kwasi. Can you see <laughs> us, actually? Yes, I can. Hi, Gian. Hey. <laughs> okay. Um, so, are there any questions? Yes. Three questions. One for each of you. If I remember everything in proper order, first of all, I would like to uh, really comment on the your ability to incorporate international. Um, cultures into your music to um, bring this universal concept of human development, <coughs> resistance, <coughs> progress, where censorship all of a sudden isn't targeted upon you by um, a particular power because you were talking about universal concepts. I really like that. Then, the question I have for our friend in, um, I don't know, where's my pen on my notes? Um, the, the institution that you were speaking of, the, um, just a second. That's the alliance. Uh, the, the school. The school that you were referring to? Um, oh, uh, yeah. Okay, this, um, pedagogy that you're that is being taught is this at one location or is this a project that is mobile that's going to remote locations when there is an art event occurring how is that happening okay I would like to know that and then uh, for our filmmaker here um, the archives are very, very interesting and in our fascination with that. And I think part of that is, is we have loss in, um, in collective memory in particular cultures of events because there's no one alive anymore. These are events that have happened over a hundred years ago. There is no living person here anymore to talk about it. We don't feel these things anymore. And the archives are a way of re, re illustrating to us the human experiences, the fears, the pain, the love, 
the joys, you know, all the different human experiences that are not part of the official histories. Mm. And that's why they're so very important to I'm us. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, uh, th th what kind of pain and what kind of all these different sentiments were captured in these, it's the gaze of the archive. It's not, I think when we take archive for mm -hmm. fact, mm -hmm. then we construct a history right. that right. was meant to be, that was handed down. Right. I think we need to complexify this a little bit. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There is a need to know, but why, um, my, my very first job was as a photographer, and I loved the idea of the single frame capturing the story until I suddenly realized that the story was also right here and right here. So which one is the story? How do you fill in these gaps, these, these linear narratives? Maybe, uh, you know, in Egypt we don't believe in linear narratives. We have the cyclical um, 12 hours of morning, 12 hours of night, the overworld and the underworld are connected. And so this linearity of factual events and this is what happened and it's an only single narrative is something I find very complicated. Yes. Mm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I hear you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Do you remember the question? No, I just can't quote it. Can, can okay, you just repeat it? It wasn't a question, sorry. it was a comment. Yeah, that's true. Oh, well, the question was not okay. uh, <laughs> the also comment. I'm not sure there really is a question. The it's an observation that you had mentioned about your music, that you're incorporating a lot of international uh, songs, other cultures, historical struggles. Mm -hmm. And that is a, an effective way to limit censorship from one particular political entity. And yeah. I think that's very effective. And I think it's a, that's, that's a lesson that I think a lot of performers should learn. I think it's very effective. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> you, you agree? <laughs> yes. Do you want to say something about it? Or? Uh, maybe my comrades uh, will uh, have some comment uh, on this. Nikolai, uh, Anik and Nikolai. Okay. So the. the <laughs> The concert will answer to that. Kwasi, you want to maybe say something about uh, the, yeah, about yes. Black Star Lines? Yes, uh, so the uh, Imanus Patriot teaching project, which was initiated as an art project, um, as an interventionist art project, really by an artist um, who became a teacher in the, in the College of Art was initially that, um, an artist's deep-seated uh, reservations and uh, rejection of the canon um, that had been institutionalized uh, via the colonial government in the art school, which was the Boza canon and its um, variations. So he had started to, um, you know, just take this experimental approach to it uh, early in 2003. He he started with his students, uh, which is Erika Chesebu, but because at the time the school was very um, antagonistic to such new ideas, and so he started with his class. Um, um, he was given only a drawing class. So then he started with this. Eventually, um, he started handling more uh, more courses for the undergraduates. So he was uh, infusing, you know, this mainstream curriculum with subversive elements or such experimental ideas. Then 
um, it eventually evolves. The the art teaching project evolves to become an inspiration for Black Star Lines, which is um, a larger community, uh, which you know adopts these early uh, strategies and also uh, continues in this project of massification. Because what this is, uh, Black Star Lines is affiliated to the uh, departments of painting and sculpture. Every year, you have hundreds of um, learners coming through that institution. So the potential of affecting or uh, causing a change in the, in the artistic landscape was huge. So we could not, or at least he could not, uh, dismiss the academy as, um, you know, as elitist, as, um, as uh, tra traditional. So what he wanted to do was to cause a change through the very problem or the very problematic institution itself. So now, and in the deterritorialized um, approach to teaching, what's happening is that um, once it's peer-to-peer -peer and once it's based on sharing, every agent in the network is, is also encouraged to carry on these principles in their work. So, uh, for example, what Ibrahim Mahama is doing in the northern part of Ghana by uh, building physical structures and programming things into them to, to, to change the culture is one expression of how these ideas are extending to the other parts of the country. Uh, what Exit Frame is doing with the uh, Crit Lab, uh, the professional development program. Last year, we had it in Accra. Next year, we'll go to Kumasi. The following years, we'll change it. So the point is to, is to move it around the country, but disseminating um, you know, these pr principles and these ideas in various formats that suit us. And there are many other people doing that around the country and even outside of Ghana. Um, so that's the, that's how it's working. Next one, if that's okay. Oh, no, no, go for it. I have a comment for everyone, um, or three comments for each of you. Uh, thank you very much for these beautiful <laughs> presentations, really. I am enchanted, as Asisa would say. <laughs> um, really important work that you, all three of you, are doing in your own ways. Um, I have Basically, it's not questions, it's just like some contribution to discussion. One, Kirill, very important uh, intervention that you are making um, in the context also of this waning or weakening of anti-fascist memory within European but also general scale. Um, you know, um, what you beautifully showed is that this nationalist revision of anti-fascism that is so much linked to the Russian nation or some certain identity that is so strongly state-permitted, so to speak, has been happening already from before the Second World War onwards. So in this sense, it is a really difficult and challenging process to kind of uh, disentangle that national moment. In this sense, I really agree with you that there is a very huge difference between the project of kind of Yugoslav partisans that have been from the beginning building this transnational identity. Like New Yugoslavia is a federal idea, immediately not based on one nation. It's actually against nation, it's not the language, Yugoslav language doesn't exist and so on. So there, you are completely right. Um, second point is just that um, uh, a little bit of this guilt is not just attributed to Russia and to Putin, but also to European Union itself that has from 2009 proclaimed anti-totalitarian, yes. uh, you know, memory, which basically, you know, participates in this weakening of anti-fascist memory and gives free hand to Russia to monopolize over anti-fascism in the whole Europe. Absolutely. So this is like just one thing, maybe the general, um, for you maybe also interesting work of one Eunice, uh, what's her name, on the forest, um, also on the Belorussia and the Jewish partisans, how the, uh, you know, the, f the forest has been important for partisans, of course, as a space of the refuge of the commons, if you want uh, to, to quote quasi, um, but also 
you know, maybe kind of deeper connections from the times before to environmental movements of today. You know, you're thinking about the fires in Siberia and uh, all across the world. It could be potentially an interesting move to think environmental movement with partisan ecology mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. So that's just like one. Mm -hmm. uh, then for quasi really beautiful, uh, fascinating stuff, what you're doing uh, with collectives. Um, I was thinking about Sankofa a little bit, this myth mythical uh, bird and uh, yeah, it, it brings, I mean, I'm sure you've discussed it, uh, the uh, Walter Benjamin's angel history, you know, kind of this is now the decolonial uh, image of this angel of history. But of course, in times where you have certain kind of collapsing of dystopia, utopia, where, you know, and Krumah, what you were saying, neither west nor east, but forward. A forward at that point is still connected to certain modernization to certain economic, political, cultural progress. And today we have, you know, situation where the concept of progress is also like utterly challenged, has been challenged. So maybe that's like some kind of question, where lies then, you know, uh, kind of uh, resources for different future. Uh, and then for Jihan, finally, I really like your whole kind of works that you've been uh, describing, working on. And um, I like this criticism also of uh, decolon decolonization that becomes, you know, this kind of very fashionable turn. And it kind of turns into some kind of old conventional monument. You know, you have masses, and this is also self-criticism and criticism of artists, museums, cultural institutions, scholars, researchers working on this, armies of people that are kind of bringing important you know, challenging the narratives, but at the same time, you know, there is this threat that it replaces some kind of politics of emancipation, that we are delegating, you know, this really important decolonial push that has to be done all across the world, and these grades of change that Vijad was uh, okay. yesterday, you know, addressing. You know, so it's like, they will do our work, you know, kind of museums, artists, and so on. But we will go in our business as usual. Capitalist reality goes for it. So that's my comments. Thank you. Do you want to say something about this? Can you respond? No? no? <laughs> Shihan, do you want to respond to what he said? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I'm. I'm fascinated, actually, by all Adinkra symbols, uh, of course, because each one of them, just that, that Sankofa being one of them, and um, where they come from and their whole notion itself is quite interesting. But this, this, this connection between the past and the present. Um, even in the work you're doing, is uh, is a complicated one, and and I think uh, Vijay was saying yesterday uh, this distinction between the academics talking about all of this and then, well, the real world is just out there. How do we connect these two? And in terms of decolonization, I'm uh, I can stand accused of the same thing, absolutely, um, but. It, it's funny because I never actually realized that I had spent 25 years working on decolonization until I was suddenly being invited to speak about decolonization. But I had been working on that for 25 years, but then there was suddenly this fancy name to it, um, which I like. I mean, I'll continue doing that, mm -hmm. but I think the real challenge is stopping to think what do we mean by it, rather than continuing to put in elements of it. It's not about, it, it's like, how do we change the nature of this? And, and I think this whole concept of restitution is one of the first really challenging ones because it faces us, ourselves, with a huge problematic. 
So am I going to stand up and say, give us all the reels? Um, yeah, we want the reels, but how are they going to end up? Um, but then am I allowed to say that? Because maybe what should happen is give us back the reels, and if they're destroyed, they're destroyed. This is our business, not yours. But it's a very complicated engagement because defining what we mean by decolonization is, should not be just the prerogative of those who can. It also should be the prerogative of those on the ground and need to redefine um, what decolonization means to them today. And of course, the problematic being is, that's why I started with being internally colonized. And that's why Kwasi's work is amazing, because one of the biggest problem that everybody's calling for more education, more education, but what kind of education? Are we going to churn out a whole new generation of the same education that I had? I'm a pure product of the colonial system. So, like, do I want to continue that? I don't know how to change it, but I can identify it and maybe address it, but I can't change it. So, I, it's, voila. Kwasi, can you please say something about this? Or about his comment or reacting to Jihan? Yes, I, I think that, um, yeah, the comment is genuinely fascinating. Uh, it touches on uh, on, a, on an important thing. For, for example, I'm working on a, there's this uh, text I'm working on, which, um, you know, looks at the, the uh, similarities between uh, the Benjaminian um, notion of historical materialism where he uses Angelus novels as you know uh, as a, as an example to illustrate it and then caricature say lose misreading of the Sankofa um, rebus so the the thing that is happening there which um, for me um, is and uh, interesting is also in the um in the in the last point made by the question it says that uh, you know where lies the tools for a different future or uh, i'm paraphrasing I'm not, I'm not sure that's how you said it but um i i um in, in 2015 we organized an exhibition in kumasi it was titled silence between the lines and the subtitle was Anagrams of Emancipated Futures. Um, for us, the answer to that question is approaching it from uh, the perspective of radical immanence, such that and there's nothing essentially new, right? Um, the tools to, to, um, to redirect or to undermine um, existing structures some of them are already here. So the task is to identify these. Uh, sometimes the problem is the ends to which these tools are used, right? Um, for example, if you, if you substitute uh, the, the relationship between today, between a British um, and myself, and if you um, infuse in it, uh, you know, this genuine um, respect, genuine uh, egalitarian structures. What happens is that, you know, um, it's, it's, it's going to affect our everyday actions. It affects our, it's not just the, the larger um, things that are affected. It's, it's, it's our every, uh, it's our every engagement. What if we thought about everything we said, every step we took, uh, based on you know this notion of um, you know uh, yeah like mutuality? It's hard to do that, but what if you did? And so some of these questions kind of um, stalk me 
and and uh, through through our work as as artists, curators, critics, we we try to respond to them in various ways. Thanks. Uh, I'll ask just a few more questions to everyone here. Um, Kwasi, I wanted to say something about um, contradictory knowledges. Um, and these are also conversations that we started like some time ago when uh, you introduced me to Black Star Lines. And it was really interesting and also really important, the kind of radicality of the words that we, um, that you were using, um, that like certain words like modernity that we actually, or universality, that we're somehow uh, started to be forbidden to use them, you know, for the sake of like certain participation. And, um, and I thought it was really important, you know, like to actually have a school that is that and, you know, the contrary at the same time. And also like what it is to teach and to accept you know, like a certain way of uh, uh, circulating uh, knowledge and ideas that are you know, something and it's contrary. And I think that it's really, really beautiful. And something else also that um, stayed with me was how you also, um, I mean, first of all, you sent me the poetry of Sedu, which was also really beautiful and very important, but also this idea of um, the locality of certain mentors. I mean, not that it's like vertical that way, but there are, that there are some people that are not really mobile, so like, uh, the elders usually, and then that there is some satellites like you and Brahim and uh, you know and Eric and like, and that you are kind of wandering around like being more international and doing some other forms of work that are still connected to locality, which are also like so such also such an interesting format um, and also it is like I think the only r real radical school that I know of. <laughs> Um, mm. Yeah, um, it's it's kind of strange to like say the question to everyone and then like someone has to like remember and then answer. So you can go ahead and answer to this if you want. Yeah, um, I'll I'll just say yes. You are correct that uh, t the terms such as modernity, universality, especially in the in the um, Africanist mainstream, um, and for good reason. Uh, were or have had very problematic, um, you know, places and interpretations. Uh, for us, this is where we, and it, go, like it goes back to the in, initial question, where this posture of indifference allows us to genuinely interrogate the, um, the ideas that underpin these the um, very notions to see where even those who claim to be progenitors of these ideas themselves got it wrong right so that if you um you know true universality if you read um emmanuel kant's what is enlightenment it uh the short text it becomes very clear uh you know how the foreign policies of the european uh you know uh nations failed uh, this 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 ethics of the enlightenment right so um what we want to do is to take the radical potential in universality as such true universality but which is not just a partition of it uh you know like what um you know uh western like what the western world attempted to do um after the inception of the enlightenment um to encroach on it like that for us that's the issue genuine or true universality if we if we all adhere to it you know these are the things that um it it allows self-determination when you encroach on it um it becomes a uh you know a warped thing that no longer um you know works so the condition of modernity uh was really it, it was supposed to have been a universal idea with particular expressions, you know, various modernisms in, uh, you know, different parts of the world. It's just that the imperial histories and the 
colonial offshoots tended to store these. So what we wanted to do was to, yeah, to interrogate them um, deeply to, to find the, the emancipatory elements there as well as elsewhere, you know, in other parts of the world and to, and to create our own, um, uh, yeah, our own future. Question. Um, yeah, Shihan, thank you for the presentation. It was really fun. I actually had the chance to see the whole movie, <laughs> and um, um, well, I mean, there are two things I want to talk about. Uh, um, first of all, this idea of the catching up, which is also something that is very much related to the fall of the wall, but also to the post-coloniality. Um, that there is this kind of anxiety somehow that there is um, like a kind of like a, a delay, you know, um, and that we're kind of constantly like running towards it uh, or trying to, to catch up with it. Um, and I think it's really like uh, like in your work also this idea of like this, I mean, going backwards that you were like really stopping when Vijay used that word that it is still somehow like my, like this stopping in a moment and like not um, trying to catch up anymore, but just kind of do another uh, form in another direction. But also um, how to continue to do what we are doing without emptying it from, from, from its meaning, without creating like what contemporary art does very often is creating this kind of illusionary space of uh, of practicing politics that actually do not have any repercussion like on real politics so it's like um, and like how then to kind of by acknowledging that by having this kind of form of neorealism that is actually acknowledging where we where we where we are situated as artists but also as filmmakers but also as activists and how to uh, navigate and negotiate these things is also very important to um, go forward and, and not catch up. Can you maybe say a bit more about that? Um, yeah, I think, I think as you say, the fall of the wall kind of augmented that reality of catching up. Uh, but I think that um, the, the moment of independence itself was the beginning of the catching up process because somehow um, uh, the founding fathers with their vision for the future somehow needed to um, start off from a concept of we too are modern, we too will develop. And yeah, and that moment of stopping after the moment of independence and looking back and seeing, well, what are we going to take from all this moment of having been colonized, what are we going to re-articulate, what are we going, th that didn't happen. So I always compare it to um, the foundation of uh, a house, where you knock down the house, but you rebuild it on the very foundation of the previous one. And I think that a lot of what happened in the future uh, the, 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 the problematics that we were faced with and are faced with um, are the actual infrastructure upon which um, our leaders built, which was the actual infrastructure of colonial rule. And I think it's put best um, by a Ghanaian writer, actually, in a, in a book called The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, uh, by Aikwe Arma, which is, I think, published in 1968. And it was one of the first visionaries to see, like, yo, what are we doing? <laughs> are we just doing it all over again? Um, which we are. Um, that, so, yes, I think it was actually inherent in the independence that the catching up and being, we are like you, was the cool thing to be, uh, rather than why don't we negotiate who we are and who you are and, and what Kwasi was saying about looking each other on eye level and just being um, equality in many ways. And I don't think we really sought that. 
Um, now, what do we do about it? Um, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I keep trying to find a way to do something about it. But I think, um, I think in all these systems, there are major cracks. And it, it's really about um, whether your attitude is to accept that that is the system and I can't do anything about it, or to spend more time finding that crack and like um, widening that crack. Um, and I do think that there is a lot of change, only the change isn't connected. I think that um, there are spaces and so many people you get to know who are changing a little bit. It's just how do you connect them? Um, I mean, the, the concept of bridging, I think, is really important for me. Because so many things are happening, so many amazing people, but like, how would have I created this bridge between me and him if I hadn't been here? So each thing does have a function, but do we accept systems as they exist today? Hell no. Um, but where's the space within these systems where we can articulate forms of change. Karine? <laughs> yeah, I just have a small question. Um, well, first, I wanted to say that the f I, I first uh, stumbled upon Arkady uh, um a jam uh, uh, project, the Trans European Jam project was I received an email from Nikolai. Um, it was like an email that he was sending to several people and then I saw this and I was working on the partisan uh, project Gal and Paula just um, yeah, accepted to, to, it, to take me on board and so I stumbled upon it and it was really uh, interesting. It was like kind of a prophecy thing, you know, that was like sent from another world. Um, and um, yeah, and, and that's also how I got introduced to your work. And so, but my question is more really related to hope. Like, um, I know it sounds a bit silly to ask that, but since you are uh, part of, like you are a member of the party and you are on uh, active, uh, like active in the realm of politics and like how, 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 um, and, and this, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was this idea of like methodology of hope or methodology, like not per se as having hope as a feeling, but uh, like that you could, might take it out of the equation, but you still do everything as if you're going towards a real change, even if you don't believe in the change. And what are actually these methodologies like today, also in relation to, um, to making parties, I'm not talking about political parties, but like, concerts and like on all these methodologies of enchantment and of like chanting and screaming on stage and like how does that mm. like help each other? Okay. Um, well, uh, it's hard to, uh, to, uh, to answer just because me myself, I don't, I don't uh, think uh, that about some concrete methodologies of <laughs> of hope, I just uh, understand that in order uh, to, um, um, to 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 promote uh, my my own and uh, our co co collective political vision, that's my co co comrade Tolik. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's a, <laughs> so, uh, a so, uh, sociologist. <coughs> uh, I just have to uh, work uh, on different uh, zones, on di different spaces. And uh, <laughs> as an artist, uh, as a poet, I'm inspired very much uh, uh, by activists, by people who just somewhere far away from Moscow, uh, without maybe any hope without, uh, of course, w without any c c concrete method, of, me method of, of, of political action, of political hope and all that, they just go and do it. They try to defend uh, their piece of forest, uh, their park, the, 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 the landscape where they live and all that. And uh, it's... Uh, a little bit irrational thing for for me. I understand very good why 
people want to be, uh, why somehow want to be a poet, wants, uh, somehow want to be, wants to be a researcher, uh, an artist, and all that. And, uh, wha and, 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 uh, and uh, um, these people who just go and do something and just go and take part in some uh, um, self-organized and uh, spontaneous, uh, often dangerous uh, com com campaigns. Uh, they are just, uh, just, just, uh, just a matter of uh, uh, of inspiration, a matter of hope for uh, me, and uh, and vice versa. As an activist. But of course, I feel myself an activist also, one of those people who just tr trying to fight in the situation when there is no hope, uh, al almost no hope. Uh, as an activist, I take the, the inspiration from, 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 from poets, from musicians who just uh, uh, were the, um, the voices uh, of uh, big uh, activist movements who tried with all their uh, uh, talent, all their force to produce this hope and to somehow uh, to combine it with, with, with the hopes, with the needs of these people. So, like that, it's 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 uh, for uh, for me it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, I just feel myself as a poet and as an an activist and a musician at the same but the time and so I can take hope from 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 people who does something like that now and who did it uh, previous times and, and uh, was a kind of permanent exchange and maybe this exchange is is, is, is where I take my own hope. Maybe... Thank you. I I just wanted yeah, to, to, to add uh, two words. So uh, we talked uh, today about um, hope and universality. So um, in Russia, now we experience the moment when um, like our leadership, President Putin is trying to, to somehow um, um, introduce universalistic uh, values of uh, international importance of Russia, but at the same time, now we we we, we of course feel ourselves as a periphery because economic growth is is stopped uh, because uh, we really um, feel that Russia doesn't make a difference, even if uh, Russia can like um, annexate. Uh, Crimea, like we now feel and ourselves as a periphery. Uh, a and uh, intellectuals uh, and some old school school guys like like Kirill, like we still remember some like that we had a great country, we, we, we had a Soviet Union, and we had this feeling of belonging to some universalistic project. Now it is lost. And what we was doing during uh, last 15 years was like as these cultural uh, workers, intellectuals, poets, we tried to, to, um, to, to keep these values but to reintroduce them in real politics. And we always failed. We always failed. Like we tried activism and we failed. We tried to organize like uh, grassroots communist party and we failed. And this September, uh, we supported uh, our candidate who, who ran in the elections in the Russian parliament. And he succeeded. Like, he got 
the majority of the votes, then it was uh, stolen because of uh, falsification. It is really uh, like well-published story, so you can you can check it. And now, like you you never know when exactly your universalistic values and your hope being reinvested in like some new projects will will will, will succeed. So. Um, uh, and, and, and this guy, uh, Mich uh, he, his name is uh, Mikhail Labanov, uh, and Kirill was like the very important uh, figure in, in his uh, he uh, headquarter. Uh, he, he became, like during one month, he became well-known politician uh, within the whole country, within Russia. And we will now uh, think again how to, to reinvest our hope and universalism into the real politics. Thank you, Oleg. Thanks, Oleg. Yeah, I just wanted to say we will continue. We can continue the conversation in between the panels and everything. We have to stop now, and uh, we will have a break until not three but two thirty, uh, right? And that will be uh, the next panel uh, with Paula Barrero Lopez and Kwasi Wait. Bye, Kwasi. <laughs> Bye, Kwasi. Oh, no, I thought because your photo disappeared. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm really sorry that you, you're not with us and we can't continue the conversation with you. But thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Jihan. Thank Kiri. you. Thank you. Like, oh, thank you, too. Kwasi. Thank you so much. I mean, love you guys. Have a good day. Bye.